You're listening to a podcast of Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning. This is Relatively Speaking, the show all about you and your family. And I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Well, parents often do push their children to do homework, complete chores, be responsible, be respectful. But there does seem to be one area in which many parents don't do a very good job, and that's teaching children about money. So, listeners, what did you learn as a child about money management? Did you learn anything? Did anyone talk to you about saving the saving or the cost of living or what debt was and how to manage that if it happened. If nobody did, you're not alone. Many of us learned from the model of our parents um, or what we heard others say or maybe from other not such good examples. So question to you. How much should children know about money management? At what age do you think that should start? And I would like to hear your own experiences. Do you feel like your parents' behavior shaped your spending, or were they more actively involved in teaching you about it? Do you think you got good habits or bad habits? And I'd like to hear about, about either. So according to a survey by T. Rowe Price, that's that's an investment um, huge company, Uh, in 2018, they do an annual survey every year. Back in 2018, more than two-thirds of parents really were reluctant to talk to their children about money. Now, in the most recent survey in 2021, that's changed a bit. Parents talk more, and it seems to be secondary to a lot of the pandemic issues where where really money, feelings about money, money stability has changed a bit. And so, you know, that may be we're on a positive upswing in talking to children about money management, but are we doing it right? Because there are some do's and don'ts in how to talk to kids and how to model for children. And so as we move through the show, I do want to talk about that because from a developmental standpoint, we want to be developmentally appropriate. And also to remember that we don't, children are anxious enough during this time and so we don't want to pile on anxiety what we want to do is pile on responsibility and understanding and to pave a positive way for the future so i'd love for you to jump into the conversation anytime this is not money talks this is relatively speaking we're talking about family and and how to help your family along, how to foster the right kind of behaviors, the right kind of habits, and developmentally when it's okay to do what. So give us a call. Join in one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. Um, I have Michelle with me today, my producer, Michelle McAdoo. And Michelle, actually, you and I have talked about this kind of thing, actually, over the years that we've been together. You know, some questions about your daughter and what to tell her, what to allow, what not to allow. And, you know, I'm, I think it, this is a, a good show to to sort of step through all those kinds of things, right? Yes, a lot of parents uh, have questions. Um, what age is best to talk to uh, a child? Will they understand at a young age, or do you wait till they get a little older? What do you tell them? And I like what you said earlier about um, not making it so big to where you make them more anxious, meaning Mm -hmm. stressing about money. And um, my biggest thing with this show is I want to look at the 
nonverbal uh, aspect of behaviors exactly yeah. what we teach our kids by what they see right. uh, parents if we're stressing about money bills we're always talking about it our kids no matter what age they're watching us they're picking those um, habits up um, a lot of people have good spending habits or bad spending habits whatever you may think it is or some people are really thrift some people spend every dime they get or they like to live and they just spend and they're happy mm -hmm. do you think those thoughts of money or spending habits came from your upbringing, I would love to hear our audience let us know how they feel that their mindset of money was shaped. Who was it shaped from? Right. Grandparents, parents. Uh, we've, I've talked to some co-workers here, and one co-worker said her mother grew up in the Great Depression, right. through the Great Depression, and that's all she heard. Mm -hmm. So she saves everything. A, a cup, a plastic bag, anything, because I don't want to throw it away because I might need it later and I might not need to spend the money on it later. And I don't think like that. I yeah. actually throw stuff away. I've learned to do that. I used to keep things because my mother kept things. I've learned to throw things away because I don't like clutter. Yeah. So there's I'm a curious. Fine, there's such a fine balance in, in saving things that you truly can repurpose or reuse and becoming a hoarder and and really living in in a mess. Mm -hmm. um, so I I also yeah. How did you grow yeah, up? And what are your spending? Yeah, spending I like the habits. person you were just talking about. My grandparents lived obviously the Great Depression, and my father, you know, was um, a very young child and grew up in the post Depression era, and so and my mother. Um, both of them, and um, I, I think I've told this story I on, the, say, on the this radio show. Uh -huh. Yeah, before my my grandparents, both of them, uh, saved every rubber band. They saved it neatly in a little rubber band ball. They had um, net bags that, as soaps got to. Small. Too small to use. They drop it in that net bag and use it as a scrubber. Um, I had a grandmother who saved all the strings, but she tied them together and rolled them in a neat ball. So there wasn't a big mess all around. They just reused and repurposed things. Um, I saved glass drawers, and I used them instead of buy, buying those disposable containers to take food to others. I Put soups and sauces. That's a in good those. idea. Yeah, and um, I wash them and save them on my shelves and and um, pull them out when I need them. So I think uh, you can use cans right. um, to store things in um, instead of buying plastic containers and label them. So you can be creative. What about your spending um, or your mindset of about money? Money. Uh, did, yeah. did you have a conversation? Did your parents? actually talk to you? Do you remember a, a distinct conversation? Because your father owned a store. Mm -hmm. So you were in the retail. Basically, you saw yeah, we a were, lot of retail. Right. We were in the retail business. So I learned about money mm -hmm. early. I learned how to count it. I helped in the store from when I was very young. And so, yes, I... I now we, did we talk? We did talk about savings, and very early on, you know, when I worked in the store, I made money, but it went into savings. <laughs> it did not go into my hand, um, and and we did talk about that and the value of that. Now, I will say there are a couple of things that my husband and I were just talking about this show last night. And I was talking about it to my children also. And there are a couple of things that I was not taught. Um, and that was allowing me to manage my own money at some point in time. Hmm. Um, I was taught to save. Um, I was taught the value of money. I was certainly taught that we couldn't go out and buy anything. But one thing I wasn't taught is that that to have money in my hand and then through, you know, through um, grade school and, and high school to then um, have to go and, and pay for certain things and to, to then be allowed to make the judgment mm. about whether or not it was a good judgment. And so I'd really like to talk about that. I 
I think everybody who's listened to this show know my parents, I think, did a great job <laughs> in general. But that was one of those areas in which I wish I had learned more about savings. I wish I had 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 a little more experience in managing some money early on. And I'd like to know um, from our listeners, did you did you have that opportunity? And if you did, did you ever go awry? Um, I want to talk a little bit more, too, about model and how modeling can make a difference. Uh, before we go to our first break, I want to give you an example. So if you are trying to keep your child from thinking they can get anything that they want and they ask for something and you say, no, I can't afford that, and then you turn around and the next thing you do is buy something that's clearly, you know, a luxury item and you paid for it. So you gave them a mixed message. You really weren't telling the truth. Maybe you could afford it, but you didn't want to buy it because of whatever reason, whether it was they didn't need a cell phone right now or they didn't need those designer shoes or jeans or whatever, or you thought it was an inappropriate purchase. Better to give a reason mm. than, than to, to make up something that's not true. So you said... I can't afford that uh, expensive doll right now, but you turned around and bought a flat screen television that we have seven mom and dad. We don't need another one, but yeah, you want to you upgrade, about? right? Yeah. And you, uh, some parents think that children don't notice those things. They but notice they do. <laughs> everything. And we need to remember, because they do notice that, and modeling is the most important part of mm. teaching as you're moving along. Um, we got to watch what we do. Okay, let's go ahead to our first break. And when we come back, I do want to talk more about that modeling piece. I'd like to hear from our listeners about the model they had and what did they learn. And did they think maybe they learned too early on about money troubles? We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress with a Mindful Minute. Children grow up so fast, before you know it, they'll be starting kindergarten. A good way to watch for school readiness is to mark developmental milestones like talking in sentences, counting, writing, and playing well with others. Positive adult-child relationships are key to helping children meet these milestones. You already have the tools you need. Talking, singing, and reading are fun ways to help children learn and thrive. One way to celebrate these special moments is to use a milestone checklist. Healthcare providers are also a great resource to help make sure your child's on the mark and ready for the next step. Examples of developmental milestones, fun family activities, and additional resources can be found at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back, and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Michelle McAdoo. And we are talking today about um, money matters and what you learned as a child about money. What did you learn? Did your parents teach you anything about money management? Did they talk to you about any of the home finances? Did you feel like you were set and ready with a good example when you started your adult life as far as taking care of things? Did you did you know how to take care of your money? Or did you find that you were suddenly in debt um, and not even sure how it got there? So... Listeners, what kind of model did you have growing up? You heard about my model um, and and a couple of others. Did you feel like that your model was a good one? Um, 
Have you tried to change anything? Is there something that you have done differently that worked well for you in your ability to manage your finances? Um, I'd love for you to join in the conversation. I know right now with the pandemic, um, hopefully, hopefully winding down, that um, this is one of those times when everybody has had to regroup. People have lost jobs, changed jobs. Um, perhaps finances have um, have changed a lot. And this might be a really good time to regroup and look at what's going on for you and what's going on in, in your family and your teaching. So give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. I'd love to hear from you about how you grew up and then what you are doing now and if it if the way you grew up either made you do the same thing or did it make you decide you you were going to do an absolute change or another question to the audience would be a great one uh did you talk to your children about money and if so when yeah. At what age? And what yeah. did you t- tell them? Yeah. Or did you not? Let's yeah. get the first call. Let's get to see who's okay. on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, we do have a, a caller coming in, but while we're, we're getting all that in, I just thought maybe there is a reason um, that sometimes parents don't want to talk about the money is because there is sort of an emotional matter to it Um, and sometimes a feeling of perhaps uh, I don't want the kids to have to worry about anything and there is some merit to that I will say that we do want to be careful about causing too much anxiety in our children about money management and, and, you know, how much you can afford and where the money is coming from. So a fine line, don't want to increase anxiety, but want to be sure that you teach responsibility. I'll tell a funny story real quick. My... um, one of my daughters, uh, we had talked about making sure kids understand they can't have every single thing they want. And and um, my daughter told me a story the other day that she had talked to her kids about um, saving money and that over the holidays they'd spend a lot of money and they really needed to stop spending that kind of money. They couldn't continue to do that. And so that story went on. So then they went to the grocery store all together and her seven-year-old, when her mother picked up an item in the grocery store that was fairly expensive, got anxious and in front of the cashier said, Mom, are you sure you can afford that? So that's one of those things we have to keep in mind about. Um, let's go to our first caller. We have Melina and Pass Christiane. Hi, Melina. Thanks for calling. Hi. Oh, um, thank you for having my call. I just um, so I'm the youngest of five children, uh, all baby boomers, World War II generation parents, and I have observed um, we're all. 60 plus now, um, that we're all different, even though we had the same parents and grew up in the same household with the same finances. Um, all five of us were very different in how we saved and spent our money. So Interesting. That, yes. So, um, you know, we all heard the same thing from our parents, and um, I have just observed that, and I thought it was so interesting. Uh, just wanted to so Mel- that little input here. Yeah, Melina, let me ask you a couple of questions about that. So what, is there a big difference in the oldest to the youngest, and what kind of age span is there? So we're looking at um, 11 years. Was mm-hmm. uh, My uh, eldest brother was 72, would be 72. He passed away, and then uh, all the way Sorry. to 61. So that is yeah. the... Uh, 
Did you feel like the spending patterns are are different from the oldest to the youngest? For example, is uh, was the oldest brother more frugal than, say, your youngest no. sibling? Uh, no. <laughs> no, that's what was so amazing um, is I tried to figure that out. Like, you know, maybe they were born when my parents were younger. Or I was, you know, a later life child. They were better off. Um, but there really wasn't... Um, you know, much, really anything different. Um, my brother actually loves to just have a good time and spend his money. <laughs> uh-huh. um, I'm a little bit more frugal. Uh, I have the brother right next to me in age, and he was um, very um, frugal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, mm. it, it varied. And um, I just always thought that was so interesting because the five of us, we're so different in our spending and saving habits. Yeah. You know, uh, Melina, I will tell you that Michelle asked me before the show started how much did I think was just intrinsic personality trait. And I said, you know, the majority of it is model. We always talk about nurture and nature and that that probably the nurturing piece plays a big part. But some of it is just... Um, the intrinsic personality on um, uh, yeah definitely as far as how much you process through things how much you reason through if there's a little bit of anxiety about you know making sure you have everything in place and so it sounded like your brother probably didn't have much in the line of anxiety and was just kind of yeah yeah the siblings that were you know mostly into saving and worrying they tend to have a little bit more higher anxiety yeah yeah um which i think is a personality thing i don't know they were always like that all my life so (laughs) yeah yeah i i I think you're absolutely right i think that um a little bit we've talked about this a little bit of anxiety is not a bad thing because it does make you stop think through, process, think about the consequences. Um, whereas if you just have a more laissez-faire attitude, you're, you're less likely to stop and think before you do one of those impulse pieces and, and less likely to think too much about the future. So that's an interesting... It's a balance. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely is a balance. So... Um, well, thanks so much for that call. That I think that's a gr- great start. And, yeah. you know, I'll say one more thing. I think we baby boomers in general over that, that age span, um, many of us did have the example of um, grandparents at least who grew up in in the difficult depression era and so some parents came out on the other side i wonder if your oldest brother maybe because parents were so relieved to finally have some money they just were going to give him whatever they didn't have could be um and that could be but i think it was a personality thing uh-huh. for my brother, and i think it's a personality thing for myself also yeah um yeah. how we look at life and death you know and you know what what i guess you know what we feel is important yeah and um yeah and you know i have to say the people who were into spending and not saving as much um tended to not be into stuff they were more into experience Mm -hmm. yep yeah interesting i don't know if yes including myself. Uh-huh. I, you know, always weigh out, like, okay, you know, do I want to buy that to just look at or would I rather go on a vacation or trip, <laughs> you know, yep. and spend it. Good. So, yep. Well, thanks so much for your call, Melina. Appreciate it. Good start. All right. Bye-bye. Alan, Alan in Raymond has been very patient. Let's move on to him. Hi, Alan. Thanks for calling. Tell us what your thoughts are. Well, you know, it's nothing spectacular, but, um, hey, my parents are uh, born in the 20s, so um, mm-hmm. we didn't have a whole lot. I never thought about it. 
the only thing I... Luckily for me, I was able to go out and play outside. <laughs> right. Oh. Well, you know, I think that if your parents were born in the 20s, um, then they definitely grew up in the Depression era. And now you're saying that from a financial standpoint, um, you grew up, your parents grew up without much. And so you you didn't have many possessions is that correct you could say that <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so compared to a lot of people so, a lot of kids. i never paid attention to it i just maybe i was in another world bubble ahead <laughs> but, um, so uh, you didn't feel unhappy about it you enjoyed uh, going outside did it did it affect your desire to earn a lot of money to save a lot of money? Do you think that 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 ever occurred to you that that was something that you needed to do, or did you feel like that you were more looking at just um, living a good life? Uh, well, my parents didn't really well not with me anyway. I was the only boy with three sisters, so. Uh, I, anytime I came across something, like, usually it was just birthday money, Uh Christmas money. Uh, When I got a little older, uh, shoveling snow. I grew up in New York. Hard work. Um, Yeah, I, hey, I bought a a shovel for $4, and my daughter, my mom said, you're crazy. (laughs) I had that shovel most of my life. Only in the last 10 years, it disappeared. So did you buy the shovel to earn money? Oh, uh, yeah. I had a friend that – I wasn't the one that went out and got – he went and got me because he knew I could work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I had energy galore. I mean, I <laughs> I could drop of a hat. I could run a marathon. And, um, I had oodles. oodles. <laughs> I also had a tremendous appetite. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you should have if you were doing a lot of snow shoveling. So, but you know, it sounds like you were a bit entrepreneurial, and that's a good thing. So, you know, you spent money on a usable item that then you could earn money with. So, yeah, as, that's not the only thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because when I, whenever I came across, I bought a matchbox or a comic. Uh huh. Uh huh. Once the comics got to twenty five cents, I stopped it because. You're just too expensive. Too expensive. Isn't that crazy? I see what they yeah. cost now. Yeah, a lot. A lot more. Um, well, Alan, thanks for that call. I really appreciate it. And I, that makes me the last thing we talked about. Every time you get his hands on money, he was going to buy something that he he would really enjoy. And um, so I'm going to throw this out to you guys, listeners, and... Um, what I have a question to you. If if your children get birthday money or allowance, should they be allowed to spend it all on whatever they wish? Or should they be encouraged or maybe even forced to save part of it? I'd love to hear from you about that. We're going to go to our next break. We're talking about teaching kids the value of money. When do you start? What do you say? How do you do it? This is Relatively Speaking. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Children grow and change so fast, it's important to help them build the strong foundations they need to help develop lifelong skills and succeed in school. Whether it's singing songs in the car or counting steps while walking to the mailbox, there are many ways to help young children learn new skills and reach new developmental milestones. Even before they can talk, babies can make connections and respond to adults' words, sounds, and facial expressions by clapping, waving, or smiling back at them. Not only is it fun, but it's important to talk, read, and sing with children. More at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. 
Welcome back, and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm here with Michelle McAdoo. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and we're talking about teaching money management and what you should do, how early should you do it, what should you say, how can you do it, encouraging responsibility without enhancing anxiety. We certainly don't want to do that, right? But we have a couple of callers I want to go ahead and get to, so let's get back to the phones. Um, Let's go to Sam from Memphis. Hi, thank you for having me. I want to describe the methodology that my parents used to teach uh, myself and my three siblings uh, an understanding of a responsibility uh, in handling money. Uh Uh, when When we hit the third grade, uh, we used to get a nickel a day. That was enough then to buy an ice cream sandwich mm. at, at lunchtime. Um, in the fourth grade, we got a quarter a week. Uh, so we had to portion out our money over the week. And ah. as time went on, we got more money to cover more time, uh, two weeks, a month, six weeks. By the time I was a senior in high school, uh, I was getting an allowance uh, that was to last me a year. Wow. Um, At age 15, we opened a bank account, obviously, to put Mm -hmm. that money in. And the idea was, if your money lasted you the year, great. If it didn't, tough luck. Wow. You got to keep the the extra. Mm -hmm. uh, You budget if you and your parents budgeted more than you actually spent. So that when I went away to college, I had a bank account, I had a budget, uh, I handled my own money, uh, and that's what we learned. And yes, my parents grew up in the Depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow, well, Sam, I just want to say, what thoughtful parents. And I love the incremental um, way that they did it because they clearly understood that an elementary school student would um, have a little bit more trouble um, hanging on to that 25 cents uh, at the beginning of the week to the end of the week. And um, But what wonderful money management in an incremental manner. Um, I think that's an awesome model. Do you feel like it really helped you as an adult? Do you feel like that you were fully equipped once you got out of college to really take care of yourself and not get into debt and not do anything that sometimes people do? Without without any question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, If I worked, which I did uh, during high school, uh, the money was mine and was mine to put into that bank account. Mm Mm-hmm. That was all good. Yeah. I would, I'm afraid I have to leave you. I'll let you go to your next caller. Well, thank you so much for that call. I think that was a, a, a wonderful model that your parents had. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Donna. Thanks for calling. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think this is an excellent show, and the topic is really, really great. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, when I was growing up, I I paid attention to a lot of how my mom managed her money and realized that she was able to do a lot with a little. Mm -hmm. So as when I had kids and they would get money, I would encourage them to, you know, save some of it and spend some of it. Mm -hmm. It didn't always work out that way, but that was the deal. But now that we have grandchildren, I encourage them to spend some of it and save some of it. Mm -hmm. And I explained to them that, you know, things will come up that maybe your mom may not have money to buy for you. So if you save part of your own money, when those things do come up, you'll have some of your own money to buy whatever it is you want to get. That's a good lesson. And And I think that if children can watch their their money get saved. I'll, I am glad that finally we're going to have a little bit of interest rate um, for bank accounts because one thing that is 
is really good, and Sam mentioned this earlier, and since you're mentioning savings, I want to just say that. One thing, if children have a bank account and they gain a little bit of interest monthly on that bank account, it can be such a reward for understanding how if you do save your money, it can get a little bit bigger. Um, I know interest rates have been so low that that has has not been much. But but I do believe as that changes, the negative is interest rates are getting bigger, but they get bigger for your savings. So maybe we'll have a little more, more encouragement. Now, you you mentioned one thing uh, I want to say. Uh, can you give me an example of um, things that your mother did to sort of stretch things and make make money last a little bit longer, or, or was it just her general behavior? Uh, well, she used to have this saying that she could make a dollar holler. <laughs> she would get so much for one dollar. So mm-hmm. she was she was a a queen of layaway. Uh huh. So my mom would use the layaway system to get many of the things we needed, and mm-hmm. she would often bring us when she would go to make her payments to show us the importance of uh, not being in a hurry to get things. Ah, uh, yes. Get things on time, and that way, when you get it. It's yours. You don't have to worry about losing it for any reason because it's already paid for. So she taught us patience. Yeah, I love that. You know, there there are not many places in which you can do a layaway like that anymore. People encourage you to put everything on credit. And and then you do have the potential of losing it or getting into some terrible debt. Um, delayed gratification, learning how to wait, is is an amazing, wonderful lesson. And I think most parents nowadays need to do a better job of that. That That is just my observation. It seems like there's the demand for something and children get it way too quickly. And so I would encourage um, parents out there to listen to what Donna learned. Um, I like the dot making a dollar holla. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think uh, that's a wonderful lesson is to learn how to stretch it. Look for things on sale. Look for, you know, consignment shops where things are typically cheaper and um, and are reused and repurposed. So. Thank you for that call, Donna. I really appreciate you calling in. That's a great lesson. You're welcome. Thank right. you. Uh-huh. All right. We're going to go to Mary from Cleveland because she called back, and I don't want to go to the break before we hear from her. Hi, Mary. Thanks for calling. Hi. How are you? I am great. Tell us what your thoughts about money management are. Well, I called in because... Um, when you said, like, what are your thoughts or your feelings, anytime I get, I'm a big reader, anytime I get a financial book, one of the first questions they ask is, what is your emotional relationship to money? Mm. And it, it's, it's a very, it's, you think you're going to get something that's going to be very cerebral, and then they always ask you that question first because they say, you know, no matter your greatest intention, if you're acting emotionally with money, then you're going to make mistakes. And I think that's my biggest thing. My my parents went bankrupt in the 80s trying to farm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of fear and anxiety with money. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and then, too, your last caller was talking about, you know, the thrift of her mother. And I learned that lesson from my grandmother. You know, the more you have, the more you need, you know, the more... Mm-hmm. When you mm-hmm. you don't make a dollar holler if you're making a lot, you know the less you, when you make less, you find that need to stretch and that ingenuity. Um, so that's been my adult life is realizing that there's a lot of fear and and then a lot of extremes, you know, like mm-hmm. not wanting to spend any money, probably from that fear of the bankruptcy, that um, legacy in our family. But mm-hmm. then. On the other hand, things like Christmas um, or shopping sprees for, you know, clothing for school, it, it always felt 
as a child, at least a little out of hand, you know, I, I kind of felt like, oh, can we afford this? Because I knew the anxiety on one hand, and then we'd go and spend the money on the other hand, and I would, you know, think, oh, can we do this, or should we be doing this? So um, that's a, that's one thing I've really had to try and balance as an adult. Yeah, I'm sure it's a fine line, and, and certainly going through a bankruptcy can be very traumatic and I'm sure it was terrible on your parents. Farming, I don't people think people understand what a big risk farming is. You can do all the right stuff and have one terrible dry season or one freeze at the wrong time and be be ruined. And I know there's insurance behind it and all of that, but it can be very costly. Um, so um, kudos to your parents for trying. I know that was difficult. I hope that we continue to get support. But yes, Mary, there is a fine line between, um, you know, making sure you know what you can do with your money and being overly anxious about it. And so, yeah, I think that's that's one of those things that I think the more confidence you have in money management, the better off you'll be. And so, uh, again, that's the reason that we thought we would do the show is because we think it's so important to prepare kids for whatever happens so that they can they can save. All right, we're going to go to our final break. Thank you, Mary, for that call. We'll be, we're going to take our break, and we'll be right back to wrap it up. We have one more caller, Daniel. Um, hang in there, and we'll get to you, and then we'll do a couple of wrap-up pieces of advice um, before the show ends. This is Relatively Speaking. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back and thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Michelle McAdoo and we're talking about money management. What do you teach your kids? So we're going straight back to the phones. I believe we have Brother Daniel. Is that right? Hey, what's going up, Mama? <laughs> the mother of Mississippi, the queen. <laughs> That's right. You you got two it you got two queens up in there. You know what I mean? Uh, oh, you make my day. Thank you, Daniel. You know, Tell us what you have. You, you know what? Mississippi, it just sounds so good. I was listening to a couple of the callers from different backgrounds, different cultures, different mm -hmm. race, and it was so good. You didn't see no, it was all colorblind. It was just, mm -hmm. you know, it was just beautiful. We got to, and this is a little wisdom God laid on my heart, we got to teach our children back what it is about values on things, on money. We got to teach them how it is. You don't have to just do it because you see it. You don't have to buy it because you got to have it. Because that's true. The lady said about emotions. We are so caught up in emotions now because of all the things that happen. We're not going to talk about all that. But, you know, um, and, and I, I'm hoping Brother Tate, Governor Tate, our brother that's watching over, listen, we need to value our kids to learn how it is to hold on to money and how to invest it. Mm -hmm. They don't teach. See, I grew, I grew up in New York. My daddy grew that up down here in Mississippi. You know, that's why I still love it because it had that value. But, see, in eighth grade, I was learning how to put money in the bank, how to mm -hmm. how to do accounts payable, accounts receivable, what it is is called the stock market. Mm -hmm. And kids today, even in the end of High school, first year college have no idea. But thanks to big coins and a couple of stash and acorn, some are learning. But we need to push it more in the, not just the urban community, but all the communities, the mm -hmm. middle class as well as the poor community, 
and so they can value more and and wisely use their money. We got to be like Andy Griffin was on on Mayberry. We got to be wise, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Got to be like riflemen. Remember the riflemen, don't you? Oh, we of course. We got to be wise. <laughs> Teach our kids to go out there with us. Know what it is to do the chores and and respect what you have in the family. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. You said so much good stuff, as always. And um, if we would just start talking like that and teaching some of those things, high school students are very capable of understanding how to manage a bank account if you do the proper teaching. So I just uh, had a thought come to me. I, I looked up how many lottery, mega lottery winners still have their money. And the truth is, is many of them don't still have their money. And the reason is, um, I think something that one of our callers mentioned earlier, if people suddenly have this bucket load of money, they've never learned how to manage it, they do impulse things, buy things they many times. And so even hundreds of millions of dollars can go away if you start investing it in the wrong places. So that's why I'm not telling everybody that if you win the lottery, you're not going to be able to keep your money. But odds are, if you don't understand money management, you may not do a very good job of taking good care of it. So We're going to post a lot of these recommendations on our um, website, but I do want to throw out a few things that you can do as parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or just advisors to others to do with kids. Okay, so here we go. Ask a kid to guess the price of something in the grocery store. Make sure they understand that milk doesn't cost a dollar. A gallon of milk is much more expensive than it used to be. Um, like I said earlier, don't tell kids you have no money um, and then go buy something yourself. Explain to them why you think they don't need that particular item. Let them know if the it, item is too expensive, that's okay. You can say that, but then don't go be a bad model and demonstrate that that wasn't the truth, right? Um, Don't tell your kids that you're worrying a lot about paying for college or some sort of postgraduate degree, because then they may start thinking that would be a reason that they shouldn't go to college. So start talking to them about how you're saving for college and what you're doing, but not about worrying. A couple of other things that I just want to remind you about is... Be honest. Make sure that you talk about values and not figures. Don't talk to kids about how much money you make because then they may get into a comparison. But do talk about how much things cost because I think they need to understand. And then I love um, one of the recommendations from one of our callers. Teach children that they don't have to immediately have Um, what they think they want. You can teach them how to wait for something special, how to save for something special. So those are just a few tips. I know you got a lot of tips from our callers, and I want to thank them, as always, for the wonderful thoughts. If you want to hear this whole show in its entirety or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Just search Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. You know this show is a production of MPB Think Radio, and the call screener and engineer was Michelle McAdoo. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking, and that you'll stay tuned. For here, for NPR's Here and Now, coming up next, right here on MPB Think Radio.